During the pandemic, I felt like something was really off. I was trying to figure out what is wrong with me. I ended up self-diagnosing that I had ADHD. On this episode of the Level Asian podcast, we're joined by Natalie Yantotonsky, founder of Full Time Lives. I went through a very long period, probably at least a year of trying to grapple with that in terms of my own identity. The grieving that you go through when you realise that all along there was something a bit different about yourself, but it wasn't just my skin colour, it was actually also the neurodiversity mm -hmm. that made me really different from other kids my age. Mental health wasn't even sort of a thing during the 20s, right? No one talked about it. Absolutely. And I think in the Asian community, there's a lot of stigma attached. And I think the more we talk about it, that it's okay mm. to go and get formal help. It's not a shame. No, absolutely mm. not. To talk about it when life is tough. Over the last few years, people have really struggled. And unfortunately, in years to come, those struggles won't necessarily go away immediately unless more of us talk about it. All kinds of challenges spring up throughout all different stages of our lives. Mm. It doesn't necessarily get any easier as we get older, but how we deal with it mm. can get easier. Before we get started on today's episode, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the land of the Darug people. We would like to acknowledge and pay respects to our elders past and present and the next generation coming through. Now onto today's episode. Okay, look, the first place I actually really want to start with and, and maybe to contextualize it is we got connected through um, Jackie Lane, who um, she helped you with your book. Uh, and Jackie and I have worked together for now quite some time, you know, in a variety of different ways, but basically fundamentally helping many of our clients with, you know, being able to um, get their message out there a little bit more, particularly around their books as well. Um, and sh I remember when she told me, she's like, you've got to meet Nat. I was like, this is very cool because I never see Jackie this, <laughs> this passionate about it. And so she sent me the links and I looked at it and um, I found it really um, actually on a personal level, very interesting. Cause I think the way that I'm relating to it is going, my mother is someone who is going through that middle age, you know, she's sort of in her late fifties, early sixties now, um, trying to sort of navigate life that is very different to how it used to be, you know, very domestic, um, you know, looking after myself and my brother, we've left the nest and now she's out there sort of almost in a bit of an identity crisis trying to figure out what she is. And she still tries to be the parent in a lot of ways um, on a day to day level as well. But I guess in your words, that's how I sort of saw it, but full-time lives and, you know, the book itself and your message, like, can you sort of give a bit of a summary of what it is and what it's about? Sure. Um, that was actually my starting point in terms of my conversations with my mum, who really right. cared about what was going to happen next as she was approaching retirement. So probably a bit older than your mum. Mm -hmm. And my concern for her really drove me to go and do a whole lot of research, go and interview people who were older than me to understand how do you design a meaningful life, mm -hmm. not just the work because work can fit into it. And it was over the course of hundreds of interviews, traveling around the world, visiting places like the blue zones where people live long, mm. healthy, happy lives and bringing all that together and running workshops and discussion groups and hearing the regrets of people who were much older mm. than me and learning, gosh, there's a lot of things that we can do at midlife when women are going through lots of changes, just like your mom of becoming empty nesters and having to redefine our, our identity. It's, it's not just being a mother, wife and whatever pr profession right. you had yep. before and potentially the last few jobs of your children being dependent on you, they were designed to be convenient because of the flexibility it gave you, but you don't need that anymore once mm. your children reach a certain age. So therefore then that begs the question of why am I doing the job that I'm doing? Why am I leading these habits and lifestyles? So that's a real exciting point. It can be scary because mm. you've lost a part of your identity and mm. there's a grieving process that comes with children leaving home or school. Mm along with other changes that women are also experiencing at midlife, which is menopause. So your body's already indicating to you that you're ready for the next chapter of your life. Mm -hmm. And then the workforce is also telling you um, negative messages as we get older, um, women feel more and more irrelevant 
and invisible. Mm -hmm. And so there's all these challenges, but I also see that as being an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So there's the optimist in me that thinks, okay, I've learned so much about longevity and healthy aging. I have this unique opportunity at this point in time because I've embedded a lot of things I've learned just from hearing the stories of people who are beyond me in the stages of life, as well as all the research I've done. Mm -hmm. And I can see that when you design your life meaningfully, there's all these great things that come about it and it has a domino effect and you can influence others. So I thought, okay, what's a really easy way to make my message accessible? Mm -hmm. I thought, well, Yes, I'm already on social media. I'm already writing some articles. But a book is something, if it's packaged up really well, really positive, it's nice to touch and flick through beautiful graphics and great stories, it's something you want to put on your coffee table and come back to it every now and again, which mm. is exactly how I wanted my book to be. Mm. And it was – initially it was just me looking for resources to recommend to my clients. Right. And – um, everyone kept on talking about the books that I had referred to them. Yeah, yeah, I've read them and they would quote from them but then yeah. say, but that didn't help me change. Right. And I thought about what is it about the books that are already out there that are really factual about well-being and, and retirement and healthy ageing and all the diets, um, probably because they're so factual and they don't have enough stories mm. that um, are really emotive and can drive you to change along with beautiful graphics those are the, like the way you actually design something is really important in how it gets received and used and loved so I wanted my book to not only have great content that's informative but um, provoke people to make change yeah well there's a lot to unpack there but one of the things that um, as you were saying that was like blue zones I, I have a real um, interest in understanding Understanding sort of the blue zones as well. I haven't definitely delved up, uh, I'm sure, in as much detail as you, but do you have any sort of insights about the blue zones and sort of what makes them live longer? Because that's like super interesting to me. Yeah. So Dan Butner had done all this research and came up with nine common factors mm -hmm. that are common to the blue zones and why people lead long, healthy, happy lives. But to me, the most interesting factor, and I've seen in other longevity research and also seen in the people I meet who are leading really fulfilling lives, uh, uh, the one thing is social connections and the value of that. Mm -hmm. And I think women at midlife will often underestimate the value of their social connections. Mm -hmm. So I guess in the years leading up to this change phase of, you know, this transition period that women go through, they're busy caring for other people. They're, whether it's dependent children or ageing parents or doing a good job at work and managing team members, mm -hmm. they've kind of built up the habit of caring for others and deprioritising themselves. And right. by that very nature of caring about other people, they don't necessarily invest the time in themselves to go and have fun and find new friends. But that's a really flawed way of thinking that when mm. you're really busy to deprioritize relationships and also finding new social connections mm. and being engaged with your community, um, it's actually really important for reducing risk of chronic health disease later in life and it also extends your life expectancy and mm. quality of life not to mention all the other benefits of having a support network and mm. people who can direct you to work opportunities as well as new growth opportunities that will enable you to keep growing no matter what age. Mm. This trigger to, for you to pursue this is based on your own interactions with your mum, but I feel like, I mean, there's one thing. I mean, I, I certainly um, had to, well, and still am, going through it, but it didn't spur me to write a book and like go, go down the rabbit hole, like researching <laughs> it. Right. Like how, where did the motivation or the, I guess the curiosity come from to go down that rabbit hole and then, and then eventually say, write a book and research on it. Oh, I go down lots of rabbit holes. Is it <laughs> personality? It is. I get really <laughs> curious about a topic. Right. And, and also I think it's the product manager in me that when I see. I was going to say. So it's a combination of, 
personal curiosity as well as I think everyone should know about this. You know, I've learned all this stuff and I guess I would have lots of chats with my girlfriends, like school friends and friends from uni and colleagues and and then I would constantly get surprised that, what, you don't know all this stuff? Don't you know about the blue zones? Don't you know about the importance of social connections, not just diet and wellness, that social connections are part of your vitality? Like I keep on getting astounded even now, you know, how come everyone else doesn't know all this stuff? Because I've been living and breathing it for years. Mm. So I guess it was this constant reminder, no, um, not everyone has the time to deep dive into these topics that I'm really interested in that Mm -hmm. can improve the quality of your life and also ensure that you're going to be more productive in your career Mm -hmm. for decades to come. So Mm -hmm. I guess it's that combination of knowing that people are not as aware of the importance of focusing on these things. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are embarrassed about not knowing some of these things, even if they hear like right. certain terms. So making it really accessible and also piquing other people's curiosity without overwhelming them yeah. was really important to me. Yeah. And I guess I've also been doing some, you know, in the lead up to writing my book, I did a lot of reader research. So I interviewed women who were going through midlife change and I asked them what were some of the challenges that they're experiencing and also just trying to understand their behaviour in terms of how are they learning new things and what will influence change in them. Mm. And social media and Netflix has played a really big (laughs) part in where they spend their time and what might make them aware of new things. So that was another reason for me to create a book that was really warm and engaging and uplifting and calming at the same time because Mm. the competition for their attention Mm -hmm. is Netflix and Instagram, which are designed to keep people addicted and spend hours on end just doom scrolling. And, and, you know, I've I've been privy to that. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) (laughs) And it's really hard to pull yourself out of it, even though you know that, you know, if you look at the total number of hours that – people spend and you know it's shocking when you see the results if you you know do track the hours of how much time you spend on those sorts of programs so for me there's a sense of urgency if you don't start addressing it now and spend more time on those meaningful activities and really design your lifestyle and not just the next chapter but the next few chapters of your life if you don't do that you can end up being in a really difficult position where it's very hard to roll back from like not having that sense of purpose and not being really clear about your new identity. Yeah. It's like multiple decades of just living life a certain way. And then all of a sudden you're told to change gears and then expect to somehow do so. Right. So you often need to think, I imagine like, you know, having a tool set or things to be aware of in order to do that. And that's probably what your book unpacks a lot about. Um, but before we sort of get into more details around that, would love to sort of know your upbringing as well. Um, what was childhood like for you? And then mum and dad, you know, what did they do? And what was family life like for you? So I grew up on the upper North Shore of mm-hmm. Sydney and it was quite a conservative area. And we were one of the few Chinese families in the area. And I was probably one of the few people of colour at my school, both public school as well as high school, uh, right. the public public primary school as well as the high school I went mm-hmm. to, which was a girls' school. Yep. And um, look, it was a very comfortable upbringing and I have great friends who I'm still f- great friends with, I still see regularly. But I think when I look back of all the different phases of my life, it was one of my least favourite phases because I think mm. I was always trying to conform. Right. And um, I look back now and I realise, look, it was, you know, that point in time in Australia and, yeah, I I never felt comfortable being in my own skin on multiple levels. Right. And I think it was lack of confidence and I, I, I got bullied in primary school for looking different 
Um, and there was nothing really I, I could do about it. So I'd spent a lot of time, lunchtime, reading. Mm-hmm. So that was my it's escape. It's like a form of escapism. For yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Uh, going to another world. And mm. um, I guess my love of books came about from then. And so I guess always at the back of my mind I thought – I'd like to be an author one day and help people escape. Oh, so it was quite early on. Yeah. I, okay. look, I've had many different dreams of, you know, career-wise, but yep. I think those days of being able to escape to other worlds and fantasise, and I think I, I, I look back now and I was always quite creative, mm-hmm. so didn't have any trouble, you know, escaping even mm-hmm. for a lunchtime, thanks to books. And it wasn't until I started to really hyper-focus on Japan because I studied Japanese at school Mm -hmm. and um, went on an exchange program in year 10 and that Mm. then led me to eventually go on two year-long exchange programs to Japan. Oh, okay. So it wasn't until I spent time by myself, so like cutting off time from my family to then be in another totally different world mm. where you're never going to fit in to Japanese society and culture. So mm. so even though I probably looked more similar to Japanese, mm-hmm. but there was this acceptance that actually – Superficially? Nowhere, yeah, well, yes, superficially as yep. well as um, culturally because I wasn't born there and, you know – Learning Japanese was something that came later in high school, so it was never going to be completely like a native speaker. But I've heard that um, about Japanese culture. Like I've been to Japan myself. I know Japanese people, including friends who are Japanese, and there's almost this sort of consensus that unless you are Japanese and born in Japan to a certain degree, that you'll never be able to sort of almost get into the inner sanctums of the culture and the people, right? Um, I think they've got this con- the concept of what circles. Yep. So there's levels of closeness you can, and so I I think I had developed some of my closest friendships when I was at university there, my third year of uni, mm. living in Japan, and I did join some. They're called circles. Mm. So they're like clubs. Okay. And you spend a lot of time. You you really bond through the experiences of being part of that club. So. Yeah. You can get into it and immerse yourself through effort yeah. and also language helps a lot. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, people always knew that I was the gaijin, the Australian, yeah. um, even though my, by that time my Japanese had improved a lot. So I think it was that realisation that um, the importance of accepting who you are and that um, sort of letting go of the hang-ups of being yourself – of not being exactly the same as everyone else because you have a different lived experience mm. and different language. Mm. I think it was this existence of being in a totally different yeah. culture yep. and then realising this is okay. They they identify you as being different and it's you owning that. Mm. So you go through full circle when you kind of get put in these really extreme yeah. situations. And then – so if we if we sort of fast forward a little bit, then what did you study in university? And, you know, you mentioned you were obviously in product design, you know, in a previous life as well. Um, yeah, there's some milestones, some checkpoints there that you can sort of share. So after my year of study in Japan as a university mm. student, I then returned back to Australia and studied arts, Asian studies. Mm-hmm. I thought I wanted to get into diff- the diplomatic circles and because mm-hmm. um, I just love that environment of inter, intercultural exchange and fostering ideas with people of different cultures. Right. Yep. And I met a lot of friends from all around the world and I just love that idea of celebrating people's differences and understanding each other. Mm. So I thought by studying arts Asian studies and being able to continue learning Japanese would take me on that path. Yeah. I didn't, um, I actually abandoned <laughs> that idea because yeah. I didn't want to live in Canberra at the time. <laughs> but I then, my first career was in product marketing, working for a multinational tech company mm-hmm. and I got to spend quite a bit of time in Asia and our team was cross like 
cross Asian, Asia Pacific. Mm-hmm. So, and headquarters was in Japan. So I got to use my language skills. Nice. So it was a perfect segue into working in business, but then still be able to, in many ways, be an ambassador for Australia and mm-hmm. also that cultural understanding between the different teams across Asia mm. and use my Japanese skills. So I guess being in tech then, that was very, very early days of mm-hmm. digital. Mm. That then led me to into product management mm. and loved new product development. Also got into new product development and also I guess the types of products I really liked working on were things that were ahead of the market. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's a bleeding edge a little bit. In yeah, that sense. so I loved yeah. working on the first online shopping mall in Australia, yeah, wow. bringing together all these traditional Australian retailers mm. and helping them build their first online presence. Mm. And then eventually it was doing the same sort of thing with telcos in Australia and building their first sort of really clunky mobile experience, like in the form of SMS and <laughs> And Java, you know, it's just, um, you look back and go, gosh, they were awful <laughs> user experiences. Yeah, but, but at the time. the concept of it, the yeah. idea of having, you know, all these experiences in your pocket, which we now know as just being, you know, typical smartphone mobile app experiences. But mm-hmm. back then we were already thinking about how to enable people to do things on the go mm-hmm. and access experiences and content Mm. that they could engage with. And of course, um, going back to, I guess, the book and the trigger of it, was there anything like sort of, I guess, formative? um, You mentioned obviously your interactions with your mum where you were like, I've really got to explore this. You know, were there any like struggle points or anything where you were like inflection points that you thought, okay, I've really got to dive deep into this and get an understanding of it? During the time that I was researching. Well, just even the impetus, meaning like what were the interactions like with your mum or what did you observe, you know, seeing your mum age that you went, okay, I want to get my head around this and actually write a book about it. Yeah, for years, like even before I wrote the book, I'd have really frustrating conversations with my Mm mum when both my brother and I had left home Mm -hmm. and I really wanted my mum to do something for herself. She's a very creative, she's got such a great eye. She's very stylish. And is that where you get your style from as well? Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have a lot of fun yeah, going yeah, yeah. shopping together yeah. and choosing things. And mm. she's always wanted to be an interior designer. Mm-hmm. And ironically, I was the one who ended up studying interior design later in life. Okay. So in my 30s, mm-hmm. I decided to make a career shift. And it's almost like I was fulfilling her dream. She was vicariously living through you. Yeah, she yeah. was. And even now she says, oh, you know, what a shame you left interior design. <laughs> and <laughs> like I think- <laughs> Her regret, not yours. Yeah, <laughs> and I say, I'm actually really happy with my where my career has led me to now. Mm. I love studying interior design because it's all about conceptual interior design Mm -hmm. whereas once I became a practitioner I realised it's quite administrative Mm -hmm. and not as creative as I thought but I think my mum still has that burning desire to express herself and use it professionally because clearly that talent's there and so I guess over the years I've been trying to help her take baby steps towards either studying interior design and Mm. she did do a short course or maybe taking up more creative projects, even as recently as end of last year, we went and did a screen printing course together. Mm. And so just trying to find ways to connect with her and draw out her creativity so that she can do it by herself and then be led by curiosity. So I must say it's been this very long process of trying to get her to explore, be confident in herself to do these things. So there was a lot of resistance over it? Yes, yeah. And what what do you think that was the reason? I think it's a whole bunch of things. I think being a doctor's wife, for one, has been a big part of her own identity Mm -hmm. and also – being a wife who feels like her 
most important thing is to get a beautiful meal laid out every night Very for domestic. my dad. Yeah. Every night when he comes home, yeah. he comes back and there's this beautiful meal that's all laid out for yeah. him. So there's always been that pressure from herself yep. to fulfill that role mm. of very much being the perfect wife. Got it. And if she if she serves almost her own selfish interest, it feels like maybe a form of either betrayal or disloyalty to what her actual duties are. Because I can relate to my my own mum being very similar, although ironically, and I don't know what your dad's like, but my dad's been very encouraging about her exploring her own thing now. And she's getting really into um, traditional Chinese medicine, so Eastern medicine, and going back into studying and learning about this. So she's actually followed her curiosity very much so. But I remember in the early days, it was very difficult um, seeing her sort of grapple with, it's like even, you know, my brother and I would go and visit her and um, she'd give us like a week's worth of food. Like it was things like that where her identity was stuck to that. So it sounds like there's a lot of similarities between your mum and mine and probably a lot of Asian mums who grew up looking after the children and the, and the husband and the partners um, that they have this sort of duty to make sure home is looked after. Mm. And then the father would go out and be the breadwinner and bring the money home, right? Yeah. And there's expectations on both sides around that. So how how's that sort of, I guess, transgressed now? Is she sort of pursuing that a lot more? So there's definitely a lot more curiosity mm. and the b- book has helped. So I feel like that's a big thing that has yeah. helped in terms of her realising, oh, People are paying attention to Nat and everything that she's learned that she's packaged up <laughs> in a book. Such an Asian thing as well. <laughs> it's like, okay, she gets she's getting validated externally. I'll now respect what she's now come up with, is it? Yeah, so it's that credibility factor. Yep. And I guess in many ways it's me searching for that credibility and approval even now, right. you know, getting into my 50s mm-hmm. and still needing that <laughs> credibility <laughs> and you know, you're always the daughter, and yeah, and also, uh, yeah, just getting that approval from my parents. So I feel really proud seeing them in the front row at my book launch and them oh, knowing and being nice. to see something quite tangible, yeah, that has come from my work. That sold out really quickly, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it did really well in terms of people wanting to come and celebrate the launch of my book and mm. my parents to see that. Mm. Whereas other projects I've worked on throughout my whole career, you know, they don't necessarily understand all the work that I do. Like, I don't think everyone necessarily even mm. – yeah, if they haven't worked in business, understand what is product management. Mm. So, but they do get that a well, lot this of is something relatable, right? It is that you can actually see it. Mm. That they knew that I'd been working on it for a whole year, mm. and I'd been chipping away at it on my weekends for a whole year. So, seeing the output and then seeing other people celebrate it mm. kind of made them proud. And then, I guess, my parents have never talked more about my work and ask me questions about it than any other work project I've worked on. So the result of kind of my mum seeing the impact my book has had on other people Mm. has made her think, and interestingly, it's less about the creativity stuff, but more about the purpose aspects, Mm. like volunteering, because I do talk about the importance of giving back and being part of the community. Contribution, yep. And I talk a lot about the importance of leaning on your strength and transferable skills. And one of her strengths is her amazing cooking. Mm. She loves cooking. She's very good at it. And everyone really appreciates her cooking. (laughs) So she's been thinking about how can she contribute to community by finding a place where she can volunteer her her cooking skills. Amazing. This episode is sponsored by Mill on Wines. Mill on Wines are an award-winning family-owned winery located in the renowned wine regions of Barossa Valley, Eden Valley and Clare Valley, presenting a fusion of vineyards that seamlessly infuse new technologies with old world traditions. Their vineyards capture the essence of each region, delivering distinctive wines with complex flavour profiles in small batches, a minimalistic approach that allows the fruit to speak for itself. Explore their range at www.millonwines.com.au. Now back onto the episode. And let's get into the meat and potatoes of um, the book itself. And what are some of the insights that you've had? I mean, one of the notes that stuck out to me 
um, for the prep call was you saying the two groups that are most affected are women aged between 18 and 24 and then midlife and older. So we've talked about midlife and older, but 18 to 24 is an interesting one. Like, why is that? There's many issues with mental health and I guess um, – during the pandemic, I did work on a product management consulting project for a mental health organisation and really delved into intersectionality. Mm-hmm. Um, the organisation was looking for ways to design new services that helped the people who needed more mental health support than any other group. Mm-hmm. And what we found was it was young people who'd been badly hit by the lockdowns and and I, I think even before lockdowns in Australia there were issues with younger people and mental health particularly mm-hmm. young men and then you lay that with intersectionality so p- young people of color mm-hmm. and um, so I guess that's something that I'd love to see there to be more connection between intergenerations um, in terms of community support, Mm -hmm. the passing down of wisdom and experience Mm -hmm. from people who have gone through tough times and Mm -hmm. how did they build that resilience and Mm -hmm. how did they support themselves and each other Mm -hmm. and then be able to take young people through that Mm -hmm. journey because I guess in many ways that also fulfils the need of older people who are feeling invisible or irrelevant and Mm -hmm. feeling like they can play a, a place. So... There's so many different ways that we can solve this issue around um, the lack of mental health services, that uh, formal mental health services right. like psychology and mm. counselling services. Informally, we can be there to, I guess, be a good listener mm-hmm. and and to be aware of when colleagues and friends, fam- family members need support mm-hmm. and maybe direct them to go and get the professional help that they need. I'm just trying to sort of understand and unpack it because I'm someone who sort of almost sits in between that. I'm, you know, 33, 34. Um, and mental health wasn't even sort of a thing during the 20s, right? No one talked about it um, for me and obviously yourself as well. Um, what, what are people from a mental health perspective, do you think, based on your research and what you're seeing, honestly are struggling with? Like I, I sort of hear things around um, isolation, um, particularly with lockdowns as well. Um, many of those who are sort of during school and university, it's almost sort of those two years have robbed them of a lot of some of the, the deepest level connections that people usually make on a relationship level. I mean, you talked about social connections being a massive part of middle-aged and beyond, but it sounds like almost the same problems in a lot of ways for younger people as well. It's just magnified because they're at a different stage in life. Absolutely. And I think in the Asian community, there's a lot of stigma attached to mental to, health, to, yep. yes. Yep. So, so therefore, that really compounds the issues around mental health. Mm. That it's okay mm. to go and get formal help. It's not a shame. No, absolutely mm. not. To to talk about it when life is tough. Mm. Um, I think over the last few years, people have really struggled and. Unfortunately, in years to come, those struggles won't necessarily go away immediately unless more of us talk about it. Mm. And also the awareness around how to prevent it Mm -hmm. Uh, because all kinds of challenges spring up throughout all different stages of our lives. Mm. It doesn't necessarily get any easier as we get older, but Mm. how we deal with it Mm. can get easier. So then what are the, what are some of the techniques I sort of, you know, selfishly thinking about myself or even just anyone um, who, for example, you know, if we, if we sort of come back to middle aged, right. Um, Being a child of um, a mother, for example, who um, she went through menopause, I think, I want to say seven or eight years ago. Um, And I remember very acutely during that period of time, what it was like, because she had sort of quite um, uh, drastic mood changes. Um, She was almost like a different person. Um, And then sort of out the other side of menopause, meaning once it sort of it all fizzled out, uh, she became significantly more religious than she was prior to that. And I think she went through a lot of um, depression during that time and we just never identified it, was never officially diagnosed. But I think she struggled a lot 
um, during that time um, because of going through menopause. And I was, I, I remember I, I was probably maybe 16 or 17 at the time, um, quite young. So this actually was actually more than seven years ago now that I think about it. Um, and didn't know how to dress it. We were a family of three boys as well. <laughs> and then intersectionality, you talk about sort of being three boys, Asian, mental health not being a thing. I think she definitely struggled big time during that period of time. Mm. So that's this is a long-winded way of just saying, like, if if someone is in that position that I was like, whether male or female, and they've seen their mum say go through something like this, or even afterwards, what are some of the insights that you've gleaned that could use that people can take on to help with, you know, addressing this? So I guess the first thing is to empathise and, and that's hard for uh, – so my son's about the same age that you would have been at the time, mm-hmm. so he's 16. Mm-hmm. He's a very good listener and he's very cognisant of the moods of people around him mm-hmm. and, and I, I guess I'm probably at a very similar stage to your mother when at that point time when you Mm -hmm. were 16 and so that awareness of what might be going on in her life physically as well as other things that she might have been experiencing at what was she working at the same time um she she yes I, I mean we had a family business um so it was a stressful period of time where they used to own a supermarket a quite a large one um and they her and my dad used to work day in day out you know six seven days a week so yeah i think maybe on a financial level um physical level and then of course mental level as well yeah so did she have any time for friends i would argue during that period of time now if i think back to it uh definitely I remember very vividly younger sort of being maybe in primary school that my parents every weekend would be out there hanging out with friends. Um, And then when they took over the business, which would have been around, I want to say, I would have been like, you know, just starting high school. So that's just, you know, year seven uh, for about seven years. So my entire high school period of time um, that sort of dramatically dropped, you know, and even just family outings would drop. We didn't really and the only time we travel is like if they had something they they needed to go back to china to address it's you know death in the family or something like that uh so i saw that drop off um but definitely on a social level they they didn't do as much because you know number one you know supermarket it's got to be open all the time so they'd be working on weekends yeah. but secondly when they had a day off they just wanted to do nothing they just wanted to you know stay at home and just relax and recharge and then get back into it straight away so yeah. I wonder if things would have been any different for her if she had like more time to herself to to do some self care as mm. well as connection with others. Like I think other so. friends. Yeah, I think so. I mean she's naturally a very extroverted person, so she actually enjoys being around people, but um probably much like your mum tied her identity to her family obligations first. She really wanted to make sure the the kids, meaning me and my brother, were looked after. And then, of course, her husband, my dad, um, things like making sure there was food on the table um, at night despite working, you know, all day. And then obviously beyond that, you know, um, as is Asian families, you know, you look after the young, but you got to look after the old as well. So you had the grandparents who were based overseas and their parents. So they had to um, make sure that they, you know, things like sending money back and visiting on a regular basis. You know, if they had health issues, they had to make sure they could look. They had siblings over there, but... Um, for example, my dad's the oldest in the family, so he feels the sort of an obligation to, you know, lead that charge. So my mom's was a she's a, and still is a very loyal person in many, many different ways. But definitely, like you said, didn't look after her own um, probably selfish interests at all. I would say it's probably pretty black and white in my opinion. And it's only until now where, you know, we're out of the family, she's been able to pursue things a little bit more of her own interests. Um, but certainly wasn't like that during, you know, my childhood. It was all dedication to the family. Mm. And this is the hard thing for women to realise that when they are going through those really busy periods of their lives and it's all very stressful and having to care for others, that is the time where it's not being selfish Mm. to look after themselves by going out and spending time with people who give them joy, Mm. who really appreciate them for who they are, Mm. for all the strengths that they have Mm. and to have fun with. And you can have different friends who do different things. Like, you know, I've got friends who I have lots of laughs and, you know, do fun things with and others who nurture my personal growth. 
Others, it's more about reflecting, what do I need? So having those different types of friends are so important at that phase in life when women are trying to juggle lots of different responsibilities, in care, in, including caring for other mm. people. That's the, It's not being selfish mm. by taking a bit of time, even if it's just one or two hours a week to go and hang out with friends who really bring all those positive aspects of you mm. out. But how does, how do you, and I'm being practical again, it's like, it's one thing to know on a fundamental level, you've got to do that. But like, again, if I'm in my position or anyone in my position would be like, how do you, I can't, I would find it hard to convince my mum to, to do that at that point in time. She would have thought, no, there's a million other things that are high priority. You know, my stuff takes a back seat. Like, are there any, and you may not know the answer, but what can you do? What can you say to go, hey, like, yeah, like mum, you got to look after yourself a little bit because it's not selfish. It's because in the long term, it's going to be better. Otherwise, it's going to be at the detriment of the family, say, down the track. And we have to say, you know, you become sick and there's all these issues and all these problems. We've got to look after you. Is there any sort of anything we can do there? Asking questions. Right. So it's really that's because everyone's different. And what your mum versus my mum, what they get joy out of and what helps them top up their energy mm is going to be different. Mm. So it's really having a conversation asking, what would you like to do differently? Mm -hmm. And then we can work out together as a family how we can support you in having more time to do that. Mm -hmm. Some people might say, actually, I want more accountability to do those things. I want to do it with with you. Or others might be might say, actually, I just need time out to see my girlfriends. It's going to be different for everyone. So it's probably more about asking that woman, what does she want? What does she need at this point in time in the next little while? Mm. What we, what can we do to support her to get more of what she needs? Mm. And are there, um, obviously we're only talking about, say, Asian mothers at this stage, but certainly it wasn't just that, that you studied and researched. But have you seen sort of any interesting insights with other struggles or what are the sort of things that you were surprised about whilst you were doing this research and you were doing the interviews mm -hmm. that you were like, wow, okay, this is like an actual problem, you know, at that stage in life. <laughs> so many challenges, um, that, which is what makes it such a interesting phase of life. Like people ask me, okay, you're focused on women. Why this phase of life? And I think it's the intersectional like life and work is all changing all at the same time mm. and how you take how you get out of it how do you move forward in a positive way can be can vary mm. so much between individuals mm -hmm. that's probably what's surprising mm -hmm. that there is no one way to do it there's everyone lands on the kind of their next chapter and how they want their life to be in many different ways mm. so um, in my book, I've got 20 different stories of women who've individually found their own way to design their next chapter. And mm -hmm. they are very different from each other. You know, from one woman, Donna Grace, who is a digital nomad and says that she's the happiest she's ever been in mm. her life. And that's because she's, you know, no longer has a mortgage. She just lives out of two suitcases now lives in India and teaches yoga, nice. has gone and bought some property to build a retreat. And, you know, that's one example. And then there's others who have probably more stability in their lives. So, so I think that's probably the thing that after interviewing so many different women and, and hearing about their stories and the pathway they got there mm. – it really varies and and that's what's fun about it. So does it start yeah. with self-awareness, do you think? Like yeah, least, yeah, it does. You've got to really be clear about how do you see yourself in the future and work backwards from there. Mm. And and then other people, it might be just intuitive, like being opportunistic of something comes up and they go, oh, that sounds really interesting. Let me try that out. Yeah. So whether you're future-oriented or more kind of experimental and spontaneous and when the opportunities come up and moving towards it and giving yourself permission mm. to do it. Mm. But you need to have that space to do it, mm. whether it's time or 
not feeling guilty or, and because you've got other obligations. So therefore having permission from – or f- not even asking for p- permission but feeling like everyone around you yeah. is going to be okay with supporting you to, mm. to take that next step. So w- what I'm hearing, if I sort of distill it, is that everyone – if we talk about just the family dynamics initially – everyone has to play a role somewhat in this process, meaning I'm a son um, and I have a mother. I need to encourage her, give her permission, um, motivate her, you know, create curiosity, that sort of stuff, right? Much like what you spoke about with your own mum. And of course that's the same for say my brother or my father, right? It's got to come from multiple people potentially. And then on my mother herself, she's got to think about it in the sense of, okay, number one, self-awareness, what am I interested in Um, and what maybe gives me meaning um, beyond obviously what I've done my entire life of serving the family and then to then avoid like catching yourself and that goes to the self-awareness piece of not just saying no to yourself or um, denying yourself the opportunity to pursue your curiosities because there's that conflicting nature of trying to go, oh, this is a form of me being selfish and I'm not looking after anyone else and that's very – you talk about intersectionality when people of color. I think that's a very, um, a massive thing. Um, mm. So it's like it, only when those two things together work in symbiosis does this whole thing work out. Absolutely. Because then it means that you feel like everyone's okay with me making this decision to move forward, to do this new thing, even if it means there's fewer hot meals on the table by the time right. everyone comes home. Yep. And that's but, okay. Yeah, and that's okay because that's part of everyone else growing up mm. in the family and being less dependent on me as the mum. And also it means that I'm setting a great example for my children in terms of moving forward and doing great big things that are outside of the family. Mm. And so I guess as you were saying, like summing it up, it made me think that was pretty the process that I took with writing my book. So I was very clear with my husband and son, okay, if I'm going to do this book in the next year, this is going to mean I have less time for you guys Mm. on the weekends Mm because I realised that the best time for me to write and research and have uninterrupted time was to do it on the weekends. So I would go into my co-working space and turn it into a working day I wouldn't answer my phone or emails and just make it all about focus on the book, Saturdays and Sundays for about a year. Right. And so I went into that telling them, okay, if I'm going to be successful and have something to show for it at the end, Mm. I need to stick to this weekly routine. Mm. Are you okay with that? Mm. And they both said, we really want you to do this. We think it'd be great for you to have something at the end to show for all the work that you've put into it. You've done so many, so much research over the years. It'd be, we would celebrate with you if you can achieve it. Yeah. So then that put the, I guess, the responsibility back onto me. <laughs> I better deliver. I better show that I'm progressing every week and every month that I'm doing something related to the book, that I'm not just going to my office every weekend Mm. and doing other work. (laughs) Um, That it's not an escape from the family. I really genuinely had to keep working on tasks related to producing the book. Yeah, gotcha. So so it's kind of this symbiotic relationship of being really clear with the family. This is the intention I've set for myself that's Mm. important to me Mm. that – and I kept on imagining what's it going to be like at that book launch – What's it going to be like when I've done the final thing, which is in this case the book? Mm. How is it going to feel for me? And also how are my family going to look at me? Mm-hmm. Are they going to be just as proud about my accomplishment mm. as, I, as how I'm going to feel? Yeah. So it becomes this group or family project that everyone's rallying you, giving you permission and space to be successful yeah, and I think permission was the word that I had in my head because it's permission, self-permission, um, but then it's obviously permission for 
the, um, I guess, stakeholders, so to speak, if we're going to be a little bit corporate about this, even though we're talking about families, that they are giving you express permission to be able to do this. Because I think fundamentally what we're trying to avoid here is we're trying to avoid misunderstandings. Um, and, and misunderstandings are, you know, essentially, a, a, I guess, a, a byproduct of poor communication as well. So it sounds almost like, and again, this is just my interpretation that, and I can sort of see why this is an issue amongst the Asian families, at least based on my experience, is the, the lack of, I guess, um, communication when we talk about topics like this. Because it's almost like taboo. It's almost like things like we're like, oh, it's, it's shameful to even raise the topic. Um, but in actual fact, we should be having more of these conversations. And, and someone has to probably be the catalyst, whether it's the mother yeah. um, or the middle-aged woman. Um, or it has to be the family members or the people who are around them who want to see them thrive when they hit that sort of stage of their life as well. Mm. And what I've found, particularly with the millennial generation, is that they really understand purpose and carving out time to Mm. do meaningful activities Mm -hmm. or developing meaningful connections. So I often find it's people who have been really clear about their own experience and the benefits of that who then lead their parents to discover it for themselves as well. Yeah. So that's really nice to see that learning from the young mm. that it influences the long-term benefits of, of really focusing on those things. So that, therefore I don't think it's being selfish Definitely. if you look at it that way. Yeah. Well, drawing on your personal experiences and just to change gears a little bit, um, you are really candid um, doing the prep call with Viv um, about a recent sort of diagnosis that you experienced yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, is this something you'd be able to share a little bit about that and sure. sort of what that journey was like? Yeah. So during the pandemic, I felt like something was really off when I was doing projects that normally would be quite easy for mm. me. Like the actual projects were fine, but certain activities like doing repetitive, boring tasks like admin and tracking my consulting hours – I really struggled with those things when we were in lockdown Mm -hmm. and I was trying to figure out what is wrong with me? Mm. Is it perimenopause? Is (laughs) it um, lack of exercise? I did all this research and you'd probably come to realise that I love doing (laughs) research when (laughs) when I want to understand something, when I'm really curious. So I ended up self-diagnosing that I had ADHD. Mm -hmm. And so I went through a very long period, probably at least a year of trying to grapple with that in terms of my own identity and looking back and thinking about all the regrets of, oh, if only I'd been diagnosed earlier and Mm. the grieving that you go through when you realise that all along there was something a bit different about yourself, but you couldn't quite pinpoint what it was. I thought it was just being an Asian Australian, a fairly white community when I was growing up, I thought it was that. But then I now look back and I realise actually it wasn't just my skin colour. It was actually also the neurodiversity Mm -hmm. that made me really different from other kids my age, other girls. So I guess by the time I realised that I have ADHD and I then decided I did want to get it formally diagnosed. There's a really long waiting list. Oh, really? So it's still a bit of a problem. So the whole shadow pandemic, mental health, there's still lack of support from a psychologist and Mm. psychiatrist. So therefore um, it took me at least another six months to get onto a waiting list and I had to – call up a lot of different psychiatrists who had um, been recommended to me. So I did all this research into, you know, which psychiatrists Mm -hmm. I thought would be good for me. But then a lot of them weren't taking on new patients. So it was this excruciating process that even though by this time I was ready Mm -hmm. to get diagnosed formally, the help wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And it's a really convoluted, complex process process that I understand is now being worked through. There's a parliamentary inquiry that's going to go into improving the way people get diagnosed. So hopefully in the future, it'll Mm. be a lot easier for people to get diagnosed. Mm. But 
for me, it's, it's been this long roller coaster, emotional ups and downs, and also the administrative side of getting diagnosed. For sure. But I have been diagnosed and very happy to say that the treatment is helping. Great. And in the meantime, because the wait was so long, I had to do all this research into strategies. Uh, you had to. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, like, um, so what I found has been really helpful is doing things like topping up exercise from a very from the beginning of the day. Cold therapy really helps. Mm. Also, body doubling. So, working with someone else. Okay. So, there's a great app called Focusmate that really got me through working on my book. Mm. So even though p- the first half of working on my book when I was writing and researching, I um, hadn't had ADHD treatment at that point. But because I'm very hyper-focused and that is a mm. positive about mm-hmm. having ADHD, mm-hmm. that hyper-focus on a topic that you're very interested in, you can get you, lost. You're harnessing it basically. Exactly. Yeah. So there's – Pros and cons of having ADHD yep. and and as soon as you learn to use your strengths, it becomes a really positive thing and that can override a lot of the negative stories that are going have been going on in your head since you were a young age. Got it. And do you, based on your, whether it's your research and stuff, is there, are you able to sort of trace back, um, even if it's just based on your opinion, how it came about and what may have sort of, I guess, caused it. Um, oh, it's genetic. You're you born with it. It's genetic. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah. 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 Like so it's, it's not environmental. No, or, no. It. Okay. It's something you're born with. Mm. And um, I guess a lot of people, once they've been diagnosed, they start to see, realise other family members have it as well. Oh, so it's very okay. common for women my age. And when we were at school, this idea of ADHD wasn't very well understood. Mm-hmm particularly amongst girls because girls are very good at masking. Mm -hmm. So it's not until mothers have a child who's been diagnosed with ADHD Mm -hmm. that then they realise and understand that they have, they potentially have ADHD as well and go and get diagnosed. Oh, that's how, so So, it has to happen to almost the child first before they explore their own. That wasn't my experience. My son doesn't have ADHD, Mm -hmm. but I hear it's very common for women my age to discover it as a result of their children. Yeah, right. I mean, it's obviously very fresh, but you sort of unofficially or self-diagnosed yourself during that period of time um, with ADHD. Um, How's that sort of changed your life in general? You know, obviously besides the focus and work, does it sort of bleed into other areas of life and how does that sort of affect things? It's made me realise the importance of routine. Mm -hmm. So um, mental health, like I guess – what I've learned about ADHD is that there's a lot of negative stories that you've been telling yourself since a very young age because you're really different and mm-hmm. you wonder why can't mm. I do all these simple things that other people find really easy. Mm. So it reinforces a lot of negative messages. So I've mm. learned over the last couple of years the importance of prioritising my mental health in order to be my best self. So therefore it's having those routines to force myself to exercise and eat well and Mm. reduce the amount of alcohol intake. Mm. Like having a really clean living lifestyle Mm. is really important and that's good for everyone, whether you have ADHD or not. So uh, I guess I realised I need it more than anyone else in order to be my best self and to do the good work that I do. And you talked about neurodiversity as well. One of the things, stats that you sort of shared was like 20% of the Australian population are neurodiverse and nobody really knows or admit that they're neurodiverse in the workplace or in a social setting. So uh, can you sort of comment on that a little bit? Because that number was quite um, interesting to me. Yeah. Um, look, even now, like this is really the first time I've publicly talked about me having ADHD mm. and being no- neurodiverse. And I, I um did that. I even spoke to my husband and son about whether I should talk about it. And even my my son said, oh, do you think you should check with your parents first? Oh, really? Yeah, I thought that was a really yeah. interesting thing for him to say yeah. because he's actually personally very confident and doesn't necessarily feel like he needs to check with us as his parents. And I thought it was really interesting that he thought I needed to check (laughs) with my parents. Maybe it's his way of protecting you, I suppose. Yeah. Mm. And I think that might be a reflection of Mm. general social, uh, general culture and attitudes that 
well, potentially there might be backlash or maybe my me talking about it and putting it out there that there could be negative consequences mm. of people judging me mm. because it is considered to be a type of disability mm. um i thought about it and i i actually think well i've had a career where i've actually been able to use my superpowers like lateral thinking strategic planning i may not be good with the day-to-day organization mm. but the big picture strategic planning and seeing trends before they become mainstream, those are all traits of someone with ADHD Mm. and the creativity and problem solving, Mm. innovation. So as long as we're really clear about not just the negatives of the symptoms of having ADHD but also the strengths that come with it. For sure, yeah. And acknowledging there are amazing strengths in the neurodiverse community. Mm. And that's something to be celebrated Mm. by organisations and employers and really understanding if you're trying to bring in a certain type of culture or certain traits and people who've got these inherent strengths and you don't even need to offer training to enable certain teams to be really innovative and be able to problem solve. So there's more clarity around the benefits of certain neurodiverse parts of the community and therefore employing people based on those positive traits, then that's actually a really good thing. Yeah, and and just as you were talking about how you were able to be hyper-focused in things that you were interested in, I think it's like the destigmatization of all the connotations around what ADHD is, right? Because I think um, at least while, while we're having this conversation, I'm like, I never, I personally have never sort of seen it as even a form of any sort of, I guess, disability. Um, And if anything, it's just, for me, it's just like a, it's just a trait. Like it's just, you're you're like this, I'm like this. Not one is better than the other or one is worse than the other as well. Um, But I think certainly I have a lot of respect for you coming on to share about that because it's very hard to be vulnerable. I mean, I, I do this podcast and you know, people interact with me and they feel like they know me and I don't even know who they are, right? And they talk about topics because I share, like I talk about my mother on this thing. Um, and uh, sometimes people can take it the wrong way. I mean, we talk about social media and how it's sort of a, a land of no consequences with people making offhanded comments and things like that and really affecting mental health that it would have been tough for you to even consider coming on. So th- thank you for doing that. Um, but I think if you sort of think about it in the context of it being, Um, almost like a mission you know a purpose like why are you sharing this sort of stuff much like how you um, why you wrote the book because it's out there that someone out there probably also is experiencing the same thing Um, and this will take them on the right path to be able to potentially explore and may or may not be diagnosed with ADHD but certainly has clarity about their circumstances and Mm. be able to move forward and then be practical about what they want to do in their life as well so um, as someone who um, you know we're working a few projects outside of this I can attest to the fact that you're Someone who definitely, as you said, um, ha- has your strengths in those the areas that even we've been talking about um, with different sort of projects. Um, so it's um, yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. Obviously, that it's something that I thought was like really um, I found like very heartfelt about you sharing this sort of stuff as well. And this is the wisdom of elders, people who've experienced things, who can talk about it, and what I love about. Level Asian is that you are showcasing and giving that platform for people to share their personal story so that your audience will be able to identify mm. with it and learn and maybe take action. Yeah. Well, I always say, I was like, this is a podcast I wish I had growing up, right? <laughs> so it's very um, poetic that we're talking about this stuff because, you know, like I said, it's um, there are people who are out there probably with the same struggles as us and if we've somewhat worked it out, not saying that we've got it all cracked, um, we've figured it all out, but um, I think people will find benefit in hearing stories like yours and many others to be able to tell that. Um, I guess a way to sort of wrap it up is, um, is there anything else, I guess, about the book and the research and the stuff that you're doing that you really wanted to share um, that you think will be helpful for the listeners and the viewers? I think my last words would be that it is so important to know yourself. We're all different. And it's celebrating those differences that will help us be our best selves, be more fulfilled, lead a full-time life 
And it's a real art because as we evolve, when we learn different things and have new experiences, we keep growing and we keep evolving. So it's important no matter what age to keep on reconnecting with yourself Mm. and also keep growing the types of connections that you have around you because there's seasons for different friendships and so it's also like there are some lifelong friends and family members play a really important role but it's also just as important to keep bringing in new people into your life who Mm. might reflect a different stage of what you're going through. I love it Um, and if people do want to connect with you um, or reach out like where's the best place to find you? Probably uh, through my website, fulltimelives.com or LinkedIn. Mm. And are you doing, I I know um, last question was sort of, you know, I know you'd ran some workshops and things like that as well. Are you, have you got anything coming up exciting that you wanted to share? Um, Anything that's in the works as well? Lots of new things. So probably the best thing to keep up with what I'm up to is to sign up to my newsletter. So I have a individual's version as well as the business leaders version nice all right well thanks for coming on the show nat appreciate you sharing everything and um yeah obviously people can check out the book um they'll be able to purchase either hard copy is there a sort of um ebook copy as well or just the hard copy the audio book's coming out shortly oh nice all right excellent so that can be obviously i imagine on amazon and kindle and things like that yeah we'll be available on those platforms awesome thanks for coming on the show thank you so much khan thanks for listening to the level asian podcast Make sure you subscribe and leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed the episode. And why not share it with friends and family who might enjoy it too? Also, make sure you head over to levelasianpodcast.com to join our email list and to receive the latest updates and get notified when the next episode drops. If you know a great guest we should feature, email us at contact at levelasianpodcast.com or DM us on our socials in the show notes. Catch you on the next episode.